Hello. I welcome you to this conference of the Leo Beck Institute, New York, Berlin. Shared history, 1,700 years of Jewish life in German-speaking lands. Our panel today is called The Search for Belonging, The Ongoing Struggles for Minority Identity. My name is Hannah Danell and I work for the Central Council of Jews in Germany. And this leads me directly to the heart of the topic because the history of the Central Council and the history of the Jews in Germany have very much in common. When the Central Council was founded 70 years ago, nobody believed that Jews would have a future in Germany. That was one of the reasons why the Central Council was uh, called Central Council of Jews in Germany and not of German Jews. The majority of the people stranded or the Jews stranded in Germany back then had never been Germans and also they wanted to make clear how brutal, what a brutal end Jews had found in Germany. And um, only two days ago there was a debate about this name. There was the assembly of the Jewish um, student union and um, the student union from Baden um, asked the Central Council to change its name from Council for Jews in Germany to Council for German Jews. They said it was about time to do that. So there was an inter interesting discussion about this topic, but um, there was no majority for it. Um, and the reason was that um, the majority found uh, Jews in Germany too diverse to call them German Jews because there are many people from other countries here as well. Leo Beck is still a very famous and important figure for everybody um, at this conference today. And um, behind me, you see the Tucholsky Straße uh, number nine. That's um, where the cen Central Council is, um, has its head head has its headquarters and Leo Beck um, had his offices there until his deportation. Leo Beck said um, after his liberation from the concentration camp that for the Jews in Germany an era had ended. Uh, the belief was that the Jewish and the German spirit could meet on a German ground and um, marry to be a blessing for the world. But this dream is over and the area of the Jews in Germany has ended forever. But already as early as 48, Leo Beck said um, there are still German Jews and uh, this is um, going to be like that. Um, so today we're going to talk about this topic with three panelists. We're going to hear, hear three presentations. You are all invited to ask questions as well. You can ask your questions in the chat. The questions are going to be collected and then are going to be asked uh, to the panelists later on. We only have one hour for our discussion. That's why we have to hurry a little bit. Here at the panel, we are going to use our first names. So let me start by introducing the panelists in the same order in which they're going to give their presentations. So now let me go to Vienna to Sabine Bergler. Hello, Sabine. Sabine Bergler has been working as a researcher and curator for the Jewish Museum in Vienna since 2014. She is responsible for the collection of the museum. She studied comparative literature and art history and she was part of the organizing team of the exhibition Ringstraße, a Jewish Boulevard. Sabine Bergler is going to talk about the romanticization of the Habsburg Empire as part of the Jewish identity. What's the rule of myths in forming an identity? And also, hello and welcome to Tel Aviv to Professor Dani Kranz. Professor Kranz is an exchange lecturer at the Ben Gurion University and she's also an applied researcher and the director of Two Foxes Consulting. Her background is anthropology, social psychology and history. Her expertise 
um, is um, migration research and ethnicity research. She is also a member of the counseling of the counseling team for the promotion of Jewish life in Germany and the fight against anti-Semitism. Dani is going to speak about sharing as caring and um, the Jews in Cologne since 1945. Then we move to Berlin and I would like to welcome Jo Frank. Jo is um, the head of the Ernst Ludwig Ehrlich Studienwerk and he is the project leader of the Dialogue Perspectives, Religion and uh, Perspectives of the World in a Dialogue and he also translates, he is a writer and he is an editor and pub publisher. Jo Frank is going to talk about the dynamics of Jewish identity today. Okay, so let us start right away. Let's start in Vienna with Miss Bergler. Yes, hello, I'm really pleased. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you today. I'm going to show you a lot of objects from our museum and I'm going to read out some quotes. So we have many interesting objects in this museum from the so-called golden era of the Vienna Jews. And it's not a coincidence that this is exactly um, the era that is romanticized um, so often by authors and Claudia Magris said uh, that this is already a Habsburg myth. It was especially Jews and Jewish writers who were romanticizing uh, the empire after its decline and in the presentation I want to explain why the Jews were so active in creating this myths, this myth and um, how it became part of the um, Austrian myth. So I'm not talking about Austrian identity but I'm um, talking specifically about this image of the old golden era that is still quoted today. It was um, influenced uh, by uh, Jewish citizens of course, non-Jewish um, Austrians have also participated in the creation of this myth, but uh, uh, Jewish um, bourgeois members of society played a very important role in it and um, the so-called Eastern European Jews who came to Vienna I around 1870 um, are usually used as an explanation for anti-Semitism at those time at this time. So when you talk about Vienna in the 19th century, you um, get the impression that um, there was a very harmonious society, a multinational harmonious society. Egon Schwarz says that Austrian, German and Jewish elements were mingling and mixing until they were hardly recognized anymore. The second largest Jewish community of Europe lived in Vienna. 9% of everybody in Vienna were Jews and uh, this seems to be a good example of shared history. But of course, this is also a question of the perspective. Of course, the relationship between Jews and um, the Habsburg monarchy was um, a history of ups and downs. Also persecution played an important role. But now let us look at this object first. It's a um, Torah shield from 186 um, by the silversmith Franz Lorenz Torinsky and you see the Habsburg imperial crown with gilded double eagle on this Torah shield. So around 186 the Jewish um, community was not allowed to hold public services and this Torah shield was a private object for private services but still there were these um, signs of loyalty with the imperial crown on the object. Um, very important for the emancipation of Vienna Jews was um, the erection of the Vienna Ringstraße. Um, a lot of um, land was sold at uh, that time and in 1860 finally the emperor decided that Jews could also buy land. So the Jewish community made this beautiful coin um, that says the Israelites of your empire, they build an altar in their hearts as an eternal monument to their gratitude. 
So the Ringstraße is maybe seen as this monument. And in both objects, you see that the Jews were trying to be part of the empire and wanted to be accepted as part of the empire. Of course, um, it was made difficult for them to be really part of the society. Arthur Schnitzler um, saw very clearly how anti-Semitic his society was um, in um, his um, books Professor Bernardi and uh, The Road to Liberty. Um, he was talking about anti-Semitism and um, it was censored by the monarchy. I have a quote here by Schnitzler and he speaks about himself here saying, they don't think I am one of them and I wouldn't want to be either. They think I am not an Austrian like they are. I am mainly myself and that's good enough for me. Nobody can take it from me that I was born in Austria. And if millions of idiots think that I don't belong here, I know better than them. I belong here more than they do. A story of disillusion is also um, linked to Theodor Herzl, um, the founder of modern Zionism. In his uh, younger years, he had other ideas. He wanted um, to um, baptize the Jews of Vienna in the Stephansdom to end discrimination. And he then dropped these ideas. He dropped his uh, motherland, so to say, and his patriotic ideas. Um, and when you look at his works um, and writings, it's uh, quite interesting that you still see Austrian liberalism in his thinking. So he couldn't turn his back to those old ideas totally. This is a posthumous portrait of him, 1930, painted by Wilhelm Wachtel, born in Vienna and um, he also worked in Vienna and in Hebrew um, it says if you will it is no fairy tale but there's a mistake in the spelling here um, it should be Aleph but it's not Aleph here and actually the text says here um, if you will it is a fairy tale So, in 1930, many books um, have started to um, create the so-called Habsburg myth. Um, the drama 3rd of November um, 1918 by Franz Theodor Czokor is one of them. He was not Jewish, but um, he talks about the jewish Austrian identity in a very interesting way in this drama. and. Um, Earth from Austria is a quote from this play. It's said in the last days of the Habsburg monarchy and there is one of the old colonels who keeps uh, talking to his soldiers about the unity of all peoples of uh, the empire. Um, he dies and his soldiers um, bury him with um, a shovel of earth from their future national home countries and um, they have earth from Hungary, from Poland, from Carinthia, from Slovenia, Czechia and Italy and the Jewish physician thinks for a while what kind of earth he should symboli symbolically use and um, then he chooses a shovel of earth from Austria. A very Im um, important um, uh, work about um, the romanticization um, is Radetzky Marsch by Josef Roth. He um, says, quote, a cruel move of history has destroyed my old motherland, the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. I love this motherland that allowed me to be a patriot and a world citizen at the same time, an Austrian and a German among all the, the Austrian peoples. I love the virtues and the merits of this motherland and today, now that it's dead and lost, I even love its failures and weaknesses. It had many of those and it atoned for them through its death. So here you see quite clearly um, 
how Yusuf Arod saw the empire and that um, he he loved this old empire and he understood that he forgot the failures because it was now dead. Here we have um, here we have a book by Stefan Zweig. He wrote a book called uh, his memoirs called uh, The World of Yesterday, and he called the monarchy the golden age of security and safety, and. I quote Stefan Zweig, everything seemed to be permanent and the state itself seemed to be a guarantee of stability forever. And um, the people's representation um, seemed to keep everything in good order. Even the currency seemed to um, be there forever. Everybody knew how much they owned and uh, was allowed what was allowed and what was prohibited everything had its norm its weight and its measure of course uh, you have to know that stefan zweig and joseph roth um, were writing, uh, writing these novels when their life was threatened by the national socialists Torberg published in 1975 quite late his book tante jolesch the Aunt Jolesch, and uh, he already was looking at history through the post-Shoah post glasses. And um, the memories of the Habsburg monarchies became um, a phenomenon of mass interest. Of course, he doesn't ignore Shoah, and um, his protagonists usually find a violent death. It's quite interesting when you talk about the Aunt Jolesch today, um, the violent um, deaths are usually forgotten. Um, most people remember mostly the funny stories. And Dante Julius is also very popular with tourists. And after um, Austria um, joined the European Union, uh, diversity in Austria has become more popular again. So this leads me almost to the end of my uh, presentation. Um, for plurality's sake, um, I, I want to raise two questions at the end of my presentation. First question is, should we really talk about shared history um, when we talk about the Habsburg monarchy? Or should we talk about shared memory of people who have envisaged something that never existed? And um, my second end to my presentation is a poem. And um, it was written by um, Friedrich Bergammer, who was born in Habsburg monarchy and had to flee Vienna when he was 19 and then moved to New York. And he wrote, the most beautiful thing about the American flag are its red, white, red stripes, said an Austrian immigrant after 37 years in America. By saying this, he didn't mean to disrespect America. He was simply grateful that this large continent slowly took on the colors of his home country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sabine. You called um, this history a uh, good example for shared history or maybe for shared memory. So let me link this to the to the other two panelists. Um, and let me ask you, how do you see the construct of a German Jewish symbiosis? Um, because many writers were also enthusiastic about that. Would you like to add something about that? Well, regarding the German Jewish symbiosis, I would say it's a concept and it can be a matter of political opinion whether you agree to that or not. With the Habsburg myth, it's different because it's um, not as political. It can be used in quite an innocent way. Not always, but it can be. And um, it's like fleeing to the past, fleeing to your um, memories. And um, I would say it's a kind of nostalgia that uh, triggers this. So people flee to the past uh, because of nostalgia. 
Well, um, we know these phenomena here as well. And I think I have to pass on the floor to the other two panelists. Danny Kranz, are you ready? Well, thank you very much for the introduction and for the very interesting presentation. And I think you will be as interesting. Um, what I'm going to show you is, well, the first page is a graph of 2009, which is part of my PhD diploma thesis. And the, it's actually the maintenance of the liberal Jewish community in Cologne, which was established in 96. And I tried to make a, a graph to show all the groupings from 1945. You have uh, the, well, the, the, the unity community where the first Jews were gathered and it who, who survived and uh, stayed in Cologne in 1945. It was a, a minority that uh, still existed uh, together with German Jews or Cologne Jews who returned from the concentration camps and um, or who were uh, wives and husbands of German non-Jews um, and um, as Hannah mentioned, there were displaced persons from other parts of Europe, so this community increased. Um, but actually, there were hardly any Jews in Cologne after the war. This is something that I found out after my field research. So um, in the first generation, there were hardly any Jews in Cologne, but in the course of time, um, there were some inner Jewish developments and uh, through context to the non-Jewish environment, political um, group uh, building. And um, so this is uh, the, 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 the next, the second group, a Jewish group. Um, there was a place where uh, Jews could meet who were left-sided, who, who were quite critical towards Israel. And there was a, a, a unity of um, an adjacent groups. And there were other groups where Jews and non-Jews met to discuss different political topics. And there were some Jewish outsiders. Um, there was the Israeli group starting from 1980. So the Israeli migration to Germany is not a new phenomenon. And there was a working group. Um, actually, we don't know when the working group was established and dissolved. It was in the 80s. They fought against anti-Semitism. And in 1996, the liberal Jewish community was founded. And we had a Yachad of LGBT Jews that was dissolved in 2004. And uh, it was mainly second generation people who wanted to meet outside the community, they, who didn't want to become members of any community. Then we also had a group of Russian speaking Jews. Um, so when I carried out a, a field research, uh, it, it ended in 2006. And we also had the Jewish community. This is a third Jewish community. So in Cologne alone, we have three Jewish communities existing alongside each other um, with different uh, qualities of relationships. And then we also had some groups uh, existing outside of Cologne and the Israeli groups. Um, these you can see in green. And there are also institutions uh, that are Jewish, like uh, umbrella institutions, the World Union of Progressive Judaism, more similar. And we also have organizations with a Jewish focus. Um, this uh, does not only consist of Jews, um, but who have a focus on Judaism. And we have different Israeli institutions. We have to be quite careful um, which uh, how we define it. Um, there, um, we also have some, we have the Israeli ambassador or the embassy, for instance. 
And we also have uh, other groups focusing on Israel, like the DIG. Um, so this is what I found in 2009. And um, this uh, is the 2020 graph. You can see the interconnections between the local groups. But these groups were actually founded by the first and second generation. The third generation did not found any such groups, with one ex exception, the Israeli groups. Um, I just transliterated the Hebrew names. And for instance, the Israeli community in North Rhine-Westphalia, then the Israelis in Cologne and uh, the surrounding areas since 2018. Through migration, we see a strong movement here, and they use the Hebrew language as well. And these two groups do not do not have contacts to the Israeli group that exists since 1980. So we have different uh, distortions and different generations between Israeli groups. They have also different reasons for meeting together. In Cologne, just like in Germany, um, we have a strong increase of this group there, and I guess that my project partner will uh, say more about this, about Israeli migration to Germany since 1990. What we can see here, um, the institutions still exist, the blue ones. And if you look at the green boxes at the bottom, you can see a multiplication. So there are much more groups with a Jewish focus or Israeli focus that are heterogeneous and um, these but these are not uh, fixed local groups but where there are changes individual changes so someone uh, who is in the liberal Jewish community also participates in the green groups um, because it uh, takes place online. So they get into contact um, through the social media online and they meet for a specific reason. But if the reason is not there anymore, then the re relationship um, seeds to exist. And uh, you can see the black arrows as well. This could only be shown um, by flash, actually. Um, well, this shows the fastness of the movement, of the interaction between the different groups. So uh, it is very interesting in uh, anthropological terms um, because we are talking about non-places that interact with each other. This is not a real place. There is not a fixed location. It's just the individuals who are linked together. And uh, so there is no um, locality. And um, well, I'm trying to stick to the time limit. Um, Ines plays a very specific role because it's uh, a link for a huge group, not only for scholarship holders, but um, they know so many people who are linked to them. And um, it fulfills a very specific function. Um, it's a dialogue that I also mentioned. It plays an important role, the dialogue between the different groups, because Jews can link with other people, people of different religions, um, who have share some kind of interest. So it is, is in Berlin, but um, it is active in the whole country and goes beyond Germany as well. So this is a huge difference to the first field research that I carried out because this kind of movement has accelerated so much because of the social media and mobile communication that uh, has a very strong effect on this. So the individual interactions have increased and 
if we look at shared history, because in the past you had shared history at a certain location, there were Jewish forums and the Christian Jewish society. Of course, they also had their internal conflicts. But in the meantime, there is a shared present and a shared future vision because Jews who participate in these different uh, events can share, can exchange ideas and fixed ethnic boundaries. These are dissolving. And now I pass on to you. Thank you, Danny. I have a few questions, but maybe can, we can do this later on. So, yo, please take the floor. Um, this was a perfect transition. Please leave the shared screen. Okay, so I will take it from here. I want to thank you for the invitation as well. Elis has uh, been uh, cooperating very closely with the Leo Beck Institute for 10 years, especially with the Leo Beck Institute in New York. And I'm especially pleased to be here and talk to you today because of that. And I also want to make use of this opportunity to thank the team of the Leo Beck Institute. So in my uh, input presentation, I want to talk about pluralism, about participation and belonging. I want to mention some of the possible coalitions and I want to talk about the struggle. And um, I will also quote some of um, the things said in the previous two presentations. Thank you, Sabine, and thank you, Daniel. Learning continues. And um, Dani uh, left uh, an open question. Uh, the Jewish community in Germany um, is very pluralistic. That's true. Religiously speaking, nationally speaking, in terms of language, it's as pluralistic now as it has never been been before after the Shoah, uh, influenced a lot by post-migration um, 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 members of our society. And um, in the community, Jewish positions are discussed in a very pluralistic way. Uh, in art, in politics, Jewish voices are heard and they become louder, more demanding and more self-confident. And this is also a result of the work of um, some institutions. And um, Dani uh, said that it's also the um, result of um, our foundation um, scholarship fund. So um, we have been working on the questions of belonging and identity for many years now, and um, we want uh, the precondition is that um, diversity is accepted. The question of identity is very complex because Jewish identities are also dynamic. They change. Individual components become more important, others become less important. And to recognize that gives us uh, the liberty to free ourselves from external um, definitions of our identity and to add um, our own elements to our own identities. This is true for Jews as individuals, as f as it is for the Jewish community. Um, the cluster of identities changes overall and also within people. So there is a kind of negotiation process and uh, some constructs um, are changed and turned into other constructs. And of course, this is not always a harmonious process. Many topics um, are very um, important at the moment, for example, gender, LGBTQI+, and um, when there's one thing that's typical about the Jewish society today, it's plurality, lively plurality, and not always harmonious plurality. And um, it is typical for lively plurality that, um, as uh, Dani told us in her presentation, that within one community, there are several small communities, especially around specific topics. 
or around specific shared uh, parts of their identity beyond the common Jewish identity, um, common denominator. For example, there's Dagesh, the artist, artist's network, um, there's student team and Morasha for students, uh, there's Keshet and that um, discusses LGBTQI plus questions and all of these subgroups of the community influence the overall commun um, community's identity. These uh, pluralistic approaches makes our community um, more than just a um, community by coincidence. Elis um, gets to know um, all kinds of young Jewish identities and we see ourselves as a catalyzer for these identities because people meet in our foundation, um, in our scholarship fund and they um, can think about how important that Jewish identity is for them. Only saying that we want to be pluralistic or we are pluralistic is not helpful in itself. It's not a simple label. Pluralism also means pluralism of history and histories, traditions, religious traditions, um, languages, opinions. And um, the only way forward is to recognize these differences and respect them. And I think um, participation is the next important topic. Participation has to be promoted. We want our voices to be heard. We want um, to demand the right to participate as a Jewish community. And um, we want to shape the society we live in. So, because I don't have so much time left, um, I um, want to summarize the main points. We um, need a quota to represent the diversity in our society so that uh, diverse people actively participate in shaping um, all the important decisions. And we need resources for these processes. Um, but uh, we don't have time and we don't have resources. So um, I represent the Jewish civil society and of course it's my task to get re resources for this civil society and to claim that we have a right to resources. And I'm not only talking about financial funds. Of course, I tell everybody who emphasizes the importance of Jewish life in Europe to put their money where their mouth is. But um, since we are in a hurry, um, with all these projects, um, we also need other resources apart from money. We need participation. We need to be represented in important institutions taking decisions. There is no belonging without participation. That's the that's the headline I should have I should have uh, chosen for my presentation actually. So shared present is more important than shared history. And as Dani said, uh, also shared future is what matters to us. So why do I highlight participation so much? In the quest for identity, participation is so important because we all know that the AFD after the coming parliamentary elections is going to receive resources to set up structures that are going to change this country for generations to come. We have learned one thing from working with uh, young gifted people in our scholarship fund. We have learned that we influence their lives for a long time and that um, this is an important tool to influence um, to influence um, our society and the anti-Semites and fascists and anti-Democrats are going to set up um, a fund of their own that they're going to use exactly for the purpose of changing our society and our country. Next year we're going to celebrate 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany and at the same time internally there are debates about the pluralistic society and um, we have a struggle going on where Jewish life um, is still or again seen as questionable in Germany. So I should also mention fear. Fear changes everyday life. Shia 
The fear um, leads people to hide parts of their identity. Fear um, hinders people from becoming emancipated as minorities. So since um, there is a lot of fear, I uh, want us to be able to defend ourselves through cooperation. Cooperation means um, cooperation with the majority society and also with other minorities. Political allegiances um, work on shared topics, for example, the freedom of religion, st structural um, exclusion, structural racism and a pluralistic commemoration culture. In order to change societies, we need coalitions, we need allegiances, we need um, common structures. And um, dialogue perspectives uh, like, for example, the uh, Jewish Muslim programs like Shalom Aleikum um, stand for that kind of coalition. But we also need to question that from time to time and ask ourselves whether these corporations are really wanted by our um, state corporation uh, partners or do they just like the idea of these corporations. I sometimes doubt if they're really as popular as they're supposed to be. And um, there's also strengthening of uh, identity or positions when you have these dualistic titles like uh, either Jewish or Muslim or German or Jewish. This um, opposing um, wording uh, is strengthened by politicians in Germany um, by speaking about Jewish people, a Jewish um, people as if there were also things like Jewish tables. Why do you um, speak of Jewish people? Why do you not only uh, speak of German citizens who are Jewish? So I think that's um, the question of identity and belonging. How does the country protect its own citizens because the Jew in, in Germany are German citizens. So I think this othering in the discourse leads mm, to the perception that uh, Jews in Germany don't belong uh, to this country. The question of belonging in present um, is um, a misunderstanding because all minorities make up a society and they all belong to the same society. So in the beginning I said that the Jewish life um, in Germany nowadays is as diverse as it hasn't been after the Shoah, but it's also um, as threatened as it hasn't been after, since after the Shoah. And uh, the state organs need to defend Jewish life, not only with the help of police officers in front of Jewish institutions. Defending democracy asks of all of us to stand up for open democracy and for all the identities that are part of this democracy. Because we are all part of this struggle this struggle about um, Jewish life being questioned by one part of the society while uh, the other part um, has to take up the responsibility for strengthening a lively Jewish life in um, our society. So um, I understand that my presentation is um, a bit like an uh, appeal um, to the audience. But I think it's part of my responsibility to make use of these uh, forums, of uh, a panel like this, to show what uh, the circumstances are under which we currently work. And I hope that this has become clear. Thank you, Jo, for this very important um, appeal to defend democracy. We all want to do that. So I also want to appeal to you. Um, belonging, safety, security, visibility. Next year, but also beyond. This is our journal. The Community Barometer, Gemeindebarometer, uh, it's also online.de. And um, this um, journal has a survey among Jews in Germany, those who have uh, been part of the Jewish community, those who are part of the community or never were. And um, 
in this survey, you can also find out what the unmet needs are. So I see that we don't have any questions from the audience. I hope that this is going to change. I would like to talk uh, to to give you the chance to talk to each other. Danny, would you like to comment on uh, Joe's presentation? Well, I was actually uh, getting my cup of coffee here. So, um, your highlights the mystification um, that Sabine talks about in the Habsburg monarchy uh, or regarding the Habsburg monarchy. And um, I think we shouldn't um, isolate Jews by um, isolating their identity because they're always part of the overall society. So, um, it's interesting that um, that people don't talk about Jews, they always talk about Jewish people. So uh, when I am, uh, I'm never asked if I'm uh, Jewish. Um, nobody asked me to speak from a German uh, perspective. Um, but of course, that's part of my identity as well. At the moment, I'm a representative of the German state. I'm a German official. Uh, sent to Israel to represent um, Germany, but when I'm invited to panels, I'm always invited as a Jew to speak from the Jewish perspective. So I speak the same language as everybody else in Germany. So my work in interreligious um, discourse um, means that I work with people from Turkey, with Sinti and Roma, um, with people from Arab countries, and our lingua franca is German. But we're usually asked to speak about um, the special aspect of being Jewish, and I think that's also a kind of othering. And I, th I find that a bit dangerous. Danny, I wanted to ask you something. In your presentation about the different connections of the groups, you mentioned at one point that it has changed a lot uh, since the first generation and the third generation is completely different. Um, I would like to ask you, <coughs> you mentioned different uh, changes and jumps in the 80s and uh, due to immigration. But what happened uh, that there was such an urge, such a need to empower themselves and to establish groups outside the community? Can you say something about this? Of course, there were huge biographical differences um, between Germans and displaced persons from other parts of Europe. And the children of these German Jews uh, did not feel uh, Germans, but they felt Jewish. And so there was a completely different generation. And uh, this did not exist in the first generation. In the second generation, you could see that certain players, due to their I, I individual identity configuration they wanted to take a part in civil society not necessarily in a religious framework and uh, they didn't want to stay in that unity communities this um, completely different so they these are completely different identity practices and in the third generation it has become much more diverse like immigration from the former Soviet Union. Um, these people are completely different. We also have immigrants from Israel. And uh, so there are also much more people. And if you have more people, you have a greater variety. And of course, um, it has a completely different appearance to the outside. 
and the trauma stress of this third generation is not as high as of the first and second generation. So there are uh, large psychological differences and the possibilities to become injured. Um, or the social media, for example, a completely different way of communication. Um, like um, when I uh, made my PhD, we did not have a social media, for instance, or it is, and I could not profit from these uh, possibilities. And the third generation is completely different with completely new opportunities. And I would say many of my friends left Germany um, after after growing up in Germany. They went um, to other countries and live in other countries because they could not see any future for themselves in Germany. Uh, on the contrary to me, because I returned, but many people stayed abroad. They wanted to flee uh, the limitations of a Jewish community in Germany. Well. Well, I'm curious um, what you are thinking um, about this. Uh, I think that um, what has changed uh, in this time is that there is uh, a bigger interchangeability of um, organizations in Jewish uh, civil society and Jewish communities. But it's also due to this young generation who uh, do not have the experiences of their parents, especially children of uh, post-Soviet immigrants. They have a completely fresh view on the situation and on the community, and they see spaces for participation. I think that this uh, is something that has changed and is changing all the time um, in a positive way in the last years and um, is it's very exciting um, that this generation that we work with at Elias is that there are children of the f first generation of post-Soviet immigrants who um, sh want to shape these spaces for themselves and they don't want to be dependent on the experiences made by their parents and grandparents. Um, of course, they have very different backgrounds coming from countries that do not exist anymore, for instance. So there is a there is much more positive energy among this uh, young generation to express it in an esoteric way. And they are also uh, more ready to allow these kind of relationships, these mutual relationships. It's a quite a positive view. I don't want to, of course, I don't want to skip the conflicts in this process, but uh, my view is rather a positive one. No, I don't think it, there, it must be necessarily negative because uh, conflicts can also lead to a progress. And uh, we need friction in order to develop in within communities and beyond communities. Um, well, I also see a threat uh, by the radicalization of the German political scenery and that uh, the AFD receives funds. If I want to be cynical, um, it, it is that we grow our own enemy. And um, I don't know um, how other foundations deal with this situation and networks, because there is a lot of cooperation. And I think it's a very strong integrative moment. We see a lot of cooperation between Elis, Avicenna, and and um, scholarship systems and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, so it's not necessarily linked to religion, but there is an um, origin and a background that is also very important. And um, we have to talk about this, um, this background. We have to, so I, I don't really know how an AFD foundation uh, can act and how, can, how, how, how we can interact with them. I, I think it's very threatening. 
And I don't know if you saw the film Mazel Tov. Uh, I uh, watched it with my students in Israel and um, I'm very grateful for uh, the version with the English subtitles um, because there are so many different topics raised by the protagonists um, which deal with identity constructions and conflicts and they become uh, visible, they become uh, graspable without um, an assessor, without um, being evaluated. It's beautiful. So because when I work, I do not judge, I just observe things. And uh, of course, I have my opinion, but it's not my task to judge. It's very important to take them in and uh, this community barometer and also the works of researchers uh, working with Jewish uh, presence. It's very important to, first of all, collect the facts and to present them without judging them. Scholars, of course, like to concentrate and focus on problems. And, uh, but Jewish life in Germany is mainly focusing on anti-Semitism research currently. But I think this is not the only point of view. And in order to be empathic, it's very important to understand people not as victims. It's very important to um, realize plurality and uh, don't uh, not to see Jewish as foreigners, as something um, alien. And I have to admit that um, it's a very difficult situation. It's a very intense uh, situation. Why do they see us in a reali realistic way? They, they consider us very exotic. Yes, for those who did not see it on the cover of the Spiegel uh, said Jews are unknown neighbors um, picturing two old men with long beards and kaftans making some kind of deals. Um, but well, my question was, my impression is um, that, of course, we know the young generation, um, we know their social uh, situation, but what's the difference to the generation of our grandparents? Are they different from them? Yes, of course, they are much more self-confident. Yes, of course, but the generation of Hannah, uh, Yo, and my children are completely different again. So they don't have this burden. Uh, a burden that was still on the third generation. But as a mother, I think it's very relieving. As a researcher, I think it's fascinating because I think that my daughter's life is much uh, easier. She, she can live as a Jew, as a German. They have different festivities and she can be very honest about her origin. And her favorite festivity is Yom Kippur, because then you can uh, ride a bike in Israel on the streets. And uh, this was something surprising in, in school. And uh, so being a Jew um, is a very specific Israeli uh, variant. And um, I think our generation would have been completely different um, of being asked about being Jewish in a, a German majority school. Yes, when I grew up, uh, they didn't want, we didn't, didn't want to stand out. And uh, of course, um, it is, it was a very specific uh, thing to think, to sing uh, Hanukkah songs in the tram, for instance. Yes. Uh, there are many things that are important to me, but uh, to come back to the political level, I think um, a lot of things are decided now. I mentioned uh, the foundations and many things are decided in the political framework and many things. So now we see 
um, how uh, relationships are or how resilient uh, relationships are that have been built up in the past. And to us, the situation is quite clear. There are um, individual foundations and also in the scholarship system, uh, the study work, Felix, uh, but this is not a consensus. This is a thing that we have to work on and therefore it was very important to me to um, make clear the plurality that we are talking about. It's not only a positive thing uh, to be happy about, but these are very serious processes, decision-taking processes within society under the pressure of non-Jewish community and non-Jewish society. Um, and this intergenerational thing is another point. This is a discussion that uh, has to be, uh, has to take place yet. Some years ago, we were talking about a lot of different migration stories within Jewish community to make them more visible. And we had an exhibition uh, curated by Belkin where these different stories of migration were presented. And it was very important for the children to uh, be able uh, to tell the stories of their parents. And this these intergenerational uh, negotiation processes have to be continued because there is always a risk that the younger generation says, uh, well, look, we are building up a lot of things, establishing a lot of things, very impressive things, um, without uh, or, or forgetting what the price was, or what, at what cost they did these things. And um, I very much support our scholarship holders, but this is something we must not forget because the previous generations had uh, to pay a very high price for this. But of course, not all the time because now uh, we are able uh, to do this in society. But um, I think wanting to do this is still a question, an outstanding question that we have to resolve and we need to find a joint answer. We have to push and find new questions. And I, Joe Steinbeck writes in his book in a very concise way or questions this wanting and this intention. Of course, um, we've received some questions, but um, unfortunately, we don't. We, we've run out of time. Uh, many participants want to know more about different communities in Germany and how they are linked together. What about uh, language conflicts between German and Russian? There are so many topics, and we also received a question from the United States about AFD. So whether this is a uh, topical only in the former GDR or in Rhineland as well, I'm afraid it's not. But unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all the questions. I would say this has been a very successful panel. We have a lot of stories to tell. And um, but Dani, you wanted to say something? Well, um, if these are the current pressing questions, um, I can offer the, the people from the audience who has these questions to write them to me directly. And I, I can also pass on questions to my colleagues and they are uh, usually very happy to share their research outcomes. And uh, there's a lot of um, interesting information regarding these questions in their research. Because for me, the knowledge transfer to civil society is very important. and. Um, I think ELIS and the Central Council, all the actors involved will agree that it's extremely important that the knowledge we have um, is shared. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that all of us agree that uh, uh, we would be happy to answer questions. If you have questions, um, send uh, the questions to the Liu Beck Institute and uh, they can then pass them on to us. So um, thank, thank you to all of you for this very constructive panel. And now I'm going to end the panel.
Goodbye and have a good conference.